Hey everybody, thanks for joining us on the Beer and Bullshit podcast again this week. So this week we had a special guest, second time on the podcast, Mr. Jill Bisson, Member of Provincial Parliament for Timmins. Uh, we had a real good chat with uh, Jill about uh, this whole COVID-19 situation, um, the provincial government's uh, response to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we talked general politics and just uh, had a real good chat with Jill, so it was a good time. I uh, hope you guys enjoy the podcast. Cheers. Beers in Bunkers. Uh, this is number 50. 50. Beer and Bullshit, number 50. Number 50. 50. So you're a very I special like, guest. I, I use the like Labatt's 50. <laughs> 50 <laughs> is amazing. Until you discovered... Go ahead, Jill. Sorry. Do they still make Labatt's 50? Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Most definitely do. Okay, well, Full Beer took over and so did Compass. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'd have to say that's a little bit of a step up in the beer game, though, if you're drinking yes, yes, uh, yes. craft beer and you've come from Labatt 50. Yeah. Although there are some diehards, though, that w- that they won't drink anything but that Labatt 50. Yeah, yeah. The other one was Molson X and Canadian. Yeah. Molson X and a Canadian. It's funny, eh, how like the, the beer game's really evolved in, oh my in the God. past, like, I don't know, it's got to be it, within the last decade that people have really taken to... To drinking craft beers and like get oh, expanding yeah. their beer it's taste. It's, it's 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 a lot better beer too, though, right? Let's let's not kid ourselves. Oh, God. That's yeah. my opinion. Beer. Yeah, yeah, I I would uh, I would agree with that. But there's definitely some people like uh, I I talk to people from my parents' generation, and they'll they'll. <laughs> well, I'm I'm glad that you you ventured into to expanding oh, your taste buds on that. But I I talk to some people and they say ah, I can't drink that. It doesn't taste like beer to me, you know. And okay, I, I, well, I I, I got to tell you my my craft beer story. So I buy craft beer. I go to Compass. I go to Full Beer. I get beer. I bring it in the fridge, mm-hmm. and that's what I like to drink in the summer. Winter, I drink wine. Right? I think okay. I, I think I got when it was beer and bullshit. <laughs> so I brought some wine. So uh, anyway, so I go and get these craft beers. And so all of my friends and family, they come over to visit and they come over and we're at the lake. And it's like the, they come in with a, a six pack or a 12 pack of Canadian or Coors Light or whatever it is. And I say, well, just put it in the fridge and help yourself. And, you know, the beer fridge is on the other side. By the time they leave, all my craft beer is gone. Yeah. And my beer is full of that other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> all the bad name. And and so finally, at one point this summer, I had to have a get together and a barbecue to get rid of all that beer. So I let them all come over. I didn't order anything from Full Beard or Compass, and they all came over, the families and friends, and they went into my fridge and they said, "Where's your beer?" And I said, "We're drinking yours now." <laughs> oh, wow. it was that beer store. No, yeah. that's a uh, that's a smart move, and uh, it, it to be to be honest, it's not the first story like that that I've heard where yeah, people yeah, feel yeah. like they're they're getting their beer like robbed from yeah. them. You know, somebody's creating some kind of beer margin when they're going yeah, and yeah. swapping yeah. it in the fridge. <laughs> oh no, they bring it over. They're very kind to bring in beer over, but they just drink the good stuff. That's yeah. all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I brought a six pack of uh, whatever I scrounged out of the back of my fridge, right? Well, exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah. Just so much of that you can have, right? Yeah, and we're and I mean, especially now, I feel like uh, our craft brewers here in town they've they've really stepped up their game to to supply people with their booze uh, in these kind of weird times that we're going through right now. Yeah. And yeah. I, I don't know if that's going to create more more converts or uh, if uh, some people have been suffering without having their they're can- going out and getting their Canadian or their cores, right? Well, I, I'm waiting for the snow to leave, then I can go restock up again. But I do, I do have about a case in the fridge in case, right? When somebody comes by, <laughs> but uh, until the snow disappears, I'll stick with my wine. Yeah, in case of emergency, you break the glass. Break and, out theory, uh, exactly. Yeah. I got one of those. Right on. Well, speaking of that, like uh, I guess uh, we we've got to talk about 
uh, I've been calling it the elephant in the room for the past couple of weeks. Anyways, uh, the yeah, the, the, <laughs> The murder, the murder hornets is what I want to talk about. No, no, the murder hornets in the room. I, I'm sure we'll 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 get to that. But uh, how have you been holding up uh, in uh, your your quarantine isolation? Well, for for me, actually, I've been doing quite all right. I'm I'm one of the lucky ones, right? I live out at Camas Scotia Lake, so like, if you look out the window, ah, pretty hard to beat. Pretty hard to beat. It's right? Good view. Yeah, so uh, so I I get up every morning at about six, like you know, like I always do, and then at, by about seven thirty, eight o'clock, I start doing my emails, and then I'm on the phone till about four or five o'clock. Sometimes later, sometimes I do things like this at eight thirty at night with people, <laughs> uh, but that's okay. That's what I do for a living. That's fine. So it's actually been good, you know. Um, people are much more resilient than you think they are. Uh, people are, you know, they're, they're, they're not happy with this. You know, nobody wants to be in quarantine. Uh, people would like to be back to what's normal, but they also want to be safe, right? So I think That's most right. people are being reasonable. I'm learning how to cook real well. I'm a good cook. I've always cooked well, but I've been doing some, I've done doing some really good things. I've learned how to make a very good rice, an excellent chili, and a couple of other things. So, you know, that, that way is going good. And our uh, youngest daughter, who lives here in town, she's, uh, you know, she's being cautious, and I don't blame her, because both myself, I've got uh, uh, cirrhotic arthritis, and as a result, I'm on a thing called Remicade, which suppresses your immune system. And then my granddaughter, Eva, has also got a suppressed immune system. So we're being very careful not to intermix type of thing for, uh, for the, you know, make sure that my granddaughters are doing fine. So, yeah, I go for visits in the driveway, you know, drive up in the driveway. The Pierre Bonbon brings a bag of candy <laughs> and he goes and visits the grandkids and mummy washes and disinfects the bag and the kids have the candy and they're happy as heck. Uh, so it's, you know, we're doing all right. That's good. That's good. I'm happy to hear that. And uh, I think that was one of the big, uh, the, the big concerns at the beginning, right? Like you mentioned that most people are more resilient than you would give them credit for, yeah. right? You would, that you would expect. Cause I think there was this kind of underlying belief that society was going to fall apart when, uh, when people were forced to stay in their house, their house for a, an extended period of time. And like mm -hmm. you say, it's not like people aren't experiencing that fatigue, but you know, we're, we're still trucking along, right? People, yeah, yeah. most people out there are reasonable. Not all of them are yahoos, right? Yeah. I, I just got a, I just got a zoom call from my aunt, my uncle and three cousins, uh, just before we did this here. And it was just like, uh, my aunt who's 81 years old found out how to use zoom. So she set up a conversation in the family. It was actually fun. For an hour, we were we were just laughing at each other. We had a great time. So it, it's a weird kind of thing. Uh, what comes out of this is is that we're learning how to do things differently, uh, both when it comes to work. Uh, you know, if an employer can have somebody meet by Zoom or whatever other mechanism that they've got in the future, not have to pay hotel rooms and airline tickets. You know, it's it's going to change the way that we do things, working from home, et cetera, et cetera, and how families connect. Like my my cousin Bridget in Sudbury was saying, you know, uh, this is the first time that I've talked to all of you guys in about three years. Like we've talked individually, but it was the first time there was about six, seven of us in the Zoom conference. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that she had done that in two or three years. So it's not the same, but it's different. And, uh, you know, you make the best you can. Yeah. No, I agreed. It, it it's been it's been quite an experience to do this on uh do the podcast anyways uh this way we've done what are we up to now jay like number 50 yeah, well number i 50. know number 50 oh. overall but on the oh, uh five? over skype like this four is it four that we've done i don't know you can't even keep track we've been doing them like every, every way weekend. more consistently than we were doing them before um and it's interesting i i sort of made that comment that um Having them over Skype, you know, there's the concern about the delays and all of that. But you you get over that quickly enough if you if you've got a decent connection, if you've got a good uh, if you've got decent equipment. And today the technology is is there, right? It's it's there to really support it. So it, it's a lot better than it used to be. I agree. Oh my goodness! <laughs> at, at some point, you you'd sort of tell yourself like, why you know it's it's less trouble to travel to where the wherever I, I need to go rather than get on a video call because that video call is going to be frustrating. But you made a point yeah. about work 
and we we talked about this last week about what work will look like. Like we spent, I don't know, we must have spent the half the podcast last week talking yeah. about uh, uh, what work from home arrangements might look like in the future. And and you know, it, it's been. I think that might end up being one of these kind of silver linings or new developments that come out of this. And I, I would anticipate you're going to see a lot more investment in things like uh, the infrastructure that supports programs like this, right? And, and in a different kind of way, you're, you're, uh, I find I get a lot more done this way than the other way. So, yeah, just put it in context. Uh, I get on the phone and I start, let's say, around 8 o'clock or so starting to call people. You go from one call to the other to the other to the other. You talk to a lot of people in the course of a day. Uh, because of you don't have to physically go from point A to point B to go meet with people, right? So you're rather than driving 20 minutes here and 10 minutes there and 30 minutes there, you're just going from one to the other, or you're going by email. So it's it's a pretty efficient way of working. Uh, I don't think it replaces. You know, you still have to have physical contact at one point, uh, but it does really change the way that you work, and I think that's what's going to come out of this. And I know as an employer, I have staff. You know, we're, we're, we're going to probably look at, you know, technology wise, uh, do we have a schedule where people can work from home for part of the time? You know what I mean? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. At the very least, right. It, it sort of gives them yeah. that option. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Like I, I felt like, um, you know, even from the education standpoint, like some of those, those sectors have been really kind of hard hit by that. Right. Like the fact that, uh, like Jay's teaching, uh, from, from home now. And my, like, uh, my wife's a teacher, she teaches from home too. And I, I've found that those kinds of, uh, adaptations are going to be the ones that it'll, it'll be really interesting to see because they're less straightforward. Right. How, how, like, how is this going to evolve when it comes out of that? And, and I, I don't know, maybe you could provide some insight on that front from like, um, any initiatives that you've been aware of that might, the that might be contributing to something like that, like some lasting, um, impacts or developments from, uh, in the education sector specifically? Well, let, let me ask you the question sure. you know, before we go there. Is that, so both of you are working from home, I take it? Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. And you have children or sub teenage years, right? Oh no, I, I, I have two two young children, one in elementary school and one about to enter elementary school. Oh, I thought I thought your kids were like in grade three, four, five. I just or look children. like I just look like I'm fifty. You look that's older. All. Yeah, that's all. Okay, it's Jason has a, Jason has the young kids. Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, I, have, I have the infants. Let me ask you though, as a parent mm-hmm. working from with two young kids that are in school yep. and a wife who works from home, how are you finding it? It's difficult. And how are the kids coping? Um, it's it's difficult, uh, but it, it sort of forces you to prioritize your time. And, uh, and like anything else, you know, prioritizing your time becomes like a reflection of what, what you value uh, doing with your time, right? Mm-hmm. And there there's often that, you know, the... I think my my kids' well being, my kids' education uh, will come before my work, uh, and and mm. the work suffers. You know, like I'm not gonna pretend like it doesn't, but mm. it, you know the the way I see it is that it it becomes uh, it, this is the choice that we're having to make right now. And I think the more you you have your your own personal priorities in line, the more comfortable you are with making those kind of sacrifices mm-hmm. on different ends. As far as the kids go, um, I mean, they're <laughs> to, to them so far, I haven't, like, I was worried that they were going to be, they were going to be really impacted by this. And, and so far I've been so impressed by just their own resilience and lack yeah. of uh, yeah. fatigue on this kind of, yeah. this kind of stuff. And we hear it all the time, right? Kids are surprisingly resilient to these kinds of things. Yeah. Changes. Yeah. Yeah, no, we have four grandkids uh, from grade six to grade, I guess, uh, K, right? Kindergarten. Sure. And they're all sort of adjusting as best they can. And they seem to be doing all right. So it's pretty cool. Uh, you know, as far as, you know, what kind of supports are, are being provided, as we know, the government <coughs> moved towards sort of online uh, teaching uh, for kids uh, at one point. I don't think that was a terrible idea. 
but I think the difficulty is how is they've done it because originally the Minister of Education said, if you're a high school student, you have to do this in order to be able to get your great uh, your your graduation. And then a little bit further down the road, we find out that's not the case. That in fact, you don't have to do what you got to do on the internet to get your grade 12. You're going to pass based on the average of what you had before you went. So I, I think that it's been a bit confusing. It's a little bit like, um, you know, I give I give Mr. Ford credit that he's been out at press conferences and he's saying the right things. He's actually been pretty upfront, and I think he's been saying the right things. And I think most people recognize. Uh, messaging is fine, but there's a bit of confusion. It's like the camping thing. You know, uh, cottages are open. No, cottages aren't open. You can't go to your cottage, but I can go to mine, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. It's 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 a little bit, he's a little bit inconsistent. Uh, and what what I find, and it's what happened in education, they say one thing, and then they end up going somewhere different. And I think that just causes confusion that you don't have to have. You know, is school going to go back after May 30th the 31st? I don't know. That's, that's that's a really good question because you see what's happening in Quebec. They were trying to open this week and they've delayed things because parents have pushed back and said, I don't feel safe. I don't feel my kids are going to be safe. And if I had <clears throat> kids in school, in school uh, and this thing is 400 uh, plus uh, infections a day in Ontario, do I want to send my kids to school? Probably not. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, it's a, it, it's an inter- like that's an interesting thing to mention because I feel like and and this is maybe me being a devil's advocate in this situation because I feel like criticism is unavoidable in, in in a situation like this because the the situation changes day by day and therefore the messaging will have to change from day by day. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I've been, and we've talked about this before about how we've been impressed with our politicians on our side of the, the border <laughs> that have yeah. well, uh, really done a good job. As much on the other side of the border. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I've been very impressed with the fact that people have avoided politicizing this. Right. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, enough. and scoring like sort of, hey, you messed up, uh, you know, like that. That was a bad decision to make because I, I think in general people are willing to extend some good faith to say, listen, maybe the decision you make today on policy, right, will look like a bad decision three weeks from now, right? Yeah. And and there's been some big organizations that have made that have sort of flip flopped on recommendations too, right? Like yeah. the WHO was saying no masks at first, and now they're saying masks. Right, it, it, but it's to be understood that this is a new situation for everyone. Yeah, and it, listen, there's no manual on this. What government, I don't care what the stripe is, uh, comes to office, I don't care if it's NDP, conservative, or liberal, there's no, there's no manual. It, like Nobody's ever gone through this type of thing in, in the memory of, of anybody alive. Like The last time we've had something as horrific was the Spanish flu, yeah. and that was 100 years ago, right? So... Uh, you know, of course, we're not going to get it right all the time. And you weren't around. Know, I've said it. I was talking to. Uh, I was doing a radio show today in Ottawa, CFRA, and I was saying, you know, I give the premier full credit. You know, these he goes up, he stands up, he answers the questions, he gives people, uh, you know, a sense of what he wants to do. Does he always get it right? Probably not. Uh, but at, there'll be a time later to judge all of this, right? At That's this right. point, we're just trying to get through it. And I think Canadian uh, politicians at all levels recognize but that's but that's typical i've always said this about politics for example in timmins is that uh, you know i i don't want to i don't want to surprise you but i'm a new democrat if you haven't noticed before what uh, i run for the ndp and i'm a new democrat this podcast but, but, is over yeah, yeah but i i exactly i'm having fun with you but <laughs> the thing i've always said to people is in be- at election time conservatives new democrats and liberals will go after each other like, you know, if you have a mayor who's a liberal or an NDP or a New Democrat uh, or a Tory, I mean, you know, during election times, we're going to back into our camps. We're going to do everything we can to help the candidate of our choice. And, uh, you know, all all gloves are off type, right? Uh, we're not dirty, but we do what we got to do, right? But in between, we tend to work together. Mm-hmm. And if you look at, you know, George Peary, you know, you figure out what his politics are. I work well with George. George worked well with Charlie and I. Prior to that, it was Mr. Black who ran against me as a candidate. 
I had a great relationship with Steve Black. We had a, uh, we collaborated on a bunch of stuff. Same thing before that with Tom Logren. So I think what happens in Canada, <clears throat> Ontario, and especially in places, writings like ours, we recognize that if we don't come together between elections, we're going to get played one against the other. So we tend to work together much better. Mm. Yeah. You think that's the case in smaller writings? Like in, uh, I think, I think it's a case in, in, in some places like ours. I, I, like I talked to my colleagues in, in different side, different parts of the house that there are different parts of Ontario, and it's not, not always the same. But here I've always felt that. I've always felt in northern Ontario we're kind of like, if we don't band together as northerners, they're going to run us over. Mm. <laughs> right. So we tend to work together. Mm. And it, so it, it, you see that dis, like regardless of your – political leanings in general. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter if you're a liberal, new democrat or a conservative in northern Ontario. At the end of the day, we all understand that we're only, you know, there's what? There's nine ridings in northern Ontario provincially, and if we don't work together to find ways to advocate for northern Ontario, we're going to get played off each other. So we try not to do that, right? So mm -hmm. we that's why you don't see us, you know, uh, it, going up against each other in between because at the end of the day, we got to make things happen. Right. Yeah, so yeah. It's what it is. Cause yeah. it makes sense. Like if one of the parties wants to push yeah. something, well, who, what are they going to identify with or, or, or what votes are you going to go after? It's going to be central or uh, Southern Ontario. They're not going to be looking. Exactly. At and, and we understand that we understand that as Northerners and, you know, even if the, even if the conservative government's a majority, they know they got to work with us. If, if we're the official opposition or the third party, it doesn't matter. They know you got to, you got to work together. It's the only way you're going to survive this. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, I, we've, we've sort of mentioned that before that we felt like the constituencies here in, in Northern Ontario seem to have, or, or I guess maybe, um, different political factions tend to have more in common with each other around here than we might have with other regions of the province, right? I, I've come down to, I think all of us understand left wing, right wing, doesn't matter, that government is actually something that could be put to good use. And if we don't have government come in and help us with some, certain things, they don't happen in Northern Ontario. You're not going to have a good transportation system, a good tra uh, telecommunication system. You're not going to have many of the things that you need to function if government doesn't do it because their economy isn't big enough to be like the, the population base isn't big enough to make it happen just on an economic basis alone. So government has to step in. Yeah. Yeah. I've always said, but like with hospitals, let's say if you privatize medicine, yeah. what company is going to want to set up a multi million or billion dollar hospital in Northern Ontario to? Yeah placate to very few customers that's right yeah. so you, you need yeah. government you know support for that yeah. stuff. if government isn't there it doesn't happen in many cases right so yeah. it's not the same in large communities like toronto or hamilton or whatever where you know you have larger communities that can make those kinds of things work but not in places like timmins or you know uh, campus casing or wherever it might be yeah and is that um like I guess kind of has that been a bit more of a, an expanding problem, like a, something that's been worsening because there, you always hear about that, right? The, the fact that the populations in the small centers are, are dwindling, right? And mm -hmm. the, the lar the cities are growing, but uh, so I guess it's, it's kind of like a consolidation of, of the population. Like people are, are leaving the regions and does that that exacerbate that problem, right? Where it becomes it does, more more industries require that support to remain yeah, viable. No, absolutely. Well, like if you look at Timmins now, we're probably around four, six thousand less than we were ten years ago. Hmm. You're just in population, and that's that's a huge amount of people in a community like ours. So Northern Ontario has been losing population to the south for all kinds of reasons. Uh, some of them are, you know, people just want to get away from the cold. And I was talking to my cousin a little while ago uh, from Timmins who's saying, geez, I, I'm, a, I'm moving to Windsor. I'm so tired of seeing snow. I know he's <laughs> joking, but, you know, there's, there's people that feel like that. Yeah. Others, it's because of work or college or, you know, relationships or whatever. And, and we, we're, we're not seeing the influx that we used to see in the past, like in the 19. 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, there was a huge influx of people because it was huge amounts of hiring. Mm. Now there's hiring, but it's not to the same degree. And we don't hire people in the same ways. 
in our forest industry or construction industry or mining industry, it doesn't hire people in the numbers that it used to before. And it's much more skilled than it used to be before. So it's a completely different economy. Yeah. And kind of circling back to what we were talking about originally, the idea that um, people can work a lot more remotely today, right? So yeah. you can ha- you can have a company that's, uh, that's operating in... Uh, um, operating here in the north but that's yeah. also got employees that are working and being highly productive anywhere else in the world really right and, and that might be something that comes out of this that might be an advantage for people in northern ontario because you know we, we in some places like timmins we got pretty good internet service it's not everywhere in timmins but in a lot of places and it allows us to be able to work remotely on all kinds of things right mm-hmm. uh, so who knows right what the opportunities will bring as we go through all of this, because I think there's going to be a major rethink about how we work as a result of this in a whole bunch of levels. You know, we were arguing against going from 14 to $15 minimum wage, you know, two years ago. Like, you know, the government, previous government that agreed to move minimum wage to 15 bucks. Ford comes in, says, no, I'm not moving it to 15. I'm freezing it at 14. And now we see the people working at the minimum wage jobs who are out there, Uh, on the front lines during this COVID-19 crisis and we're saying well they're worth more than that they should get a fair wage so I think we're going to rethink things on a whole bunch of levels you know to what degree are the jobs that we've never paid attention to so essential to making it work if your grocery store doesn't work your gas pump you can't get gas your taxi drivers you know all of that stuff the economy doesn't work and I think we're going to rethink how we do things plus how we work overall. That, well, we talked about this before, Corey. Sorry. No, uh, no, go ahead. But, but we talked about like, you know, is this issue, is this going to maybe see like a a different and new type of labor movement? Do you see, like, is there the possibility that, you know, like people realize, hey, wait a second, I am worth more. I do more than people say. I'm Yes, I'm not the, you know, whatever educated level or whatever skill level, but hey, I'm worth that much more. Like, do, do you think there's a possibility of a, a, a new age uh, labor movement possibility? Yeah, well, it, listen, if you go look at history, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I love history. I study history all the time. Uh, there's something called the Peasants' Revolt back in the 1300s in England. And the basis of the Peasant Revolt was that there was the plague that came across Europe and went into England, and it killed off about 25 to 30% of the population. Well, guess what happened? The landowners needed to get things grown on their land to make money, and there was less workers. Guess what the workers did? They asked for more. Yep. And and it was serfdom back then, is that you couldn't leave the landowner to go to the property next door because you belonged to his property, not so much to him. Well, as a result of the plague in the 1300s, workers said, well, I don't care. I'm going next door because he's paying more. Mm. And eventually... It, it started creating what we know today as a more modern sort of uh, economy where workers can demand what they're worth. And I think this is what this is going to do to a degree. Yeah. And, and I do see that part of it. The one thing that I find is concerning and is sort of going to sneak up on, on, on us is I don't see how we come out of this with, all right, we, we come out of this with a, a new take on what work looks like, especially remote work. Um, now, suddenly a whole bunch of people aren't going into offices anymore. A whole bunch of business aren't seeing the need to maintain commercial properties. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people who don't need to clean and maintain those those, those commercial properties. I, I don't see how we come out of this without some kind of net job loss. Because a lot of the responsibilities that used to go into the work establishment are going to be held by the people who are now working from home. Yeah, and it's and it's the same if you look at history again. Every time we've gone through these kinds of transitions, the economy has reinvented itself, right? So, you know, we've moved originally, if you go back in the 1800s, you know, we were an agricultural-based society. Eventually, it became an industrial society where everybody moved into the cities, and eventually those industrial cities became mechanized and you needed less workers. And we're talking about the late 1800s, early 1900s. And every time we just reinvented ourselves and the economy has taken off in a different direction. So will there be pain? I think you're right. I think 
there will be uh, some adjustment out of this, and it's not going to be pleasant. I, I tend I tend to agree with you, but I think overall, and over the longer term, things will reinvent themselves. And you know, people are resilient. That's the one thing we know out of this whole thing is that people will figure out ways of developing a niche in the economy that will allow them to do the things that we don't even think of today. Yeah, and that's that's the hope, right? Is that we we end up yeah. in a situation where we've we've kind of created that or or the the market has found has sort of balanced itself out in that way the the fear i guess and and i guess this kind of speaks to maybe us having the wisdom of what what work is essential and what it should be compensated at because what the trajectory seems to have been is that people working in an agri- agricultural society, right, when those jobs went away, they ended up moving into something like manufacturing where you could still work and support a, a, a family and, you know, there was that, that whole um, yeah. that whole aspect of it. And then when manufacturing went away, people tend to... Uh, like those the people who were working uh maybe in some of those lower skilled jobs transition into a new service economy right and going into a service economy now if the jobs of the future are going to be programming artificially intelligent um you know uh autonomous vehicles where where does the transition go from working in a service job that will be eliminated by a robot to programming that robot, but but again, it's 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 everything. It's everything from the training aspect of we got to train people up in order to be able to you know mm-hmm. uh, utilize those technologies and those opportunities, and that means people in the research R and D, people in the teaching area, mm-hmm. uh, et cetera, are going to have to get involved. Entrepreneurs are going to have to you know we're going to develop a whole different level of entrepreneurship. I think out of this. Uh, in the sense that people will be looking at different ways of being able to make a buck. So what what did we learn through all of this is that will everybody want to go back into a store in three months? Mm. Or even if everything is clear and there's no more COVID-19, will people say, you know what, I don't mind having my groceries delivered at home. Yeah. Yeah. It creates a different economy. That's all I'm saying, yeah. right? Uh, will it be a majority? Probably not. But I think the economy will change based on uh, what 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 people see as an opportunity to make a buck, mm-hmm. yep. and and I think that's just the resilience of we as human beings tend to adjust mm-hmm. right as best as we can. Again, it's going to be it's going to be hard. I don't think there's any two ways about that. But again, we need to make sure that governments provide basic support so that people can put a roof over their heads, put food on the table, and not uh, be in a bad way. And eventually we'll get through this transition. What do you think of something like universal basic income uh, as a way to smooth that transition into a new economy? I think it's a debate. I think it's a debate that we have to have. Uh, Can we do it at this point? I think uh, it's something that we need to go through and to take a look at and, 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 uh, you know, with some with some, you know, real resolve to make the kinds of differences that we do. Uh, that that we do need to make, but I I think, and and you might find this a bit odd coming from me as a New Democrat, but I think we also have to find ways to reward people to be able to innovate, to be able to produce, to be able to find ways of, you know, uh, uh, of of creating wealth themselves. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't do that, if you don't find ways of doing that, you're not going to have the catalyst necessary to create the tax dollars to do all the other things we got to do, right? Yeah. So I think, you know, uh, I think I would come at it a little bit different. I think there are people that are unable to work completely because of their situation. You know, um, people with disabilities, people that may have uh, and, uh, uh, mental health issues, et cetera. And we need to make sure that those people are well taken care of and we provide the supports that they need and they get the income they need to have dignity. And the rest of us, well, we need to have things that help us to encourage us to innovate. So if I'm going to give you money, uh, can I do that in a way that helps you innovate to be able to find different ways of making the economy work? And I think that's the real challenge. Yeah. What like I know Corey and I were talking about this last week and what if it was like do you see an expansion of like 
having this basic universal income brought into an EI situation where uh, well, it would you be have to yeah. pardon. It would probably be cheaper in the long run, but if, if you stop, if you stop and think about it, and this is this is the whole argument, right? You have workers' compensation, you have ODSP, you have long-term disability, you have OW, you have uh, you know, there's all kinds of different disability support programs. Canada Pension is the other one, right? And then on the unemployment side, you have OW unemployment insurance uh, or the other ones. If you were to just fold that all into one basic income, right? You don't have it. You don't have to administer all that. But remember, that's going to mean to say a whole bunch of people are out of work. So there's an offset, right? Yeah. So there is an advantage to going to the basic universal income from the perspective that government would actually spend less money. A lot You're a less real money. PC, aren't you? <laughs> no, no, but I, no, but that's yeah. a new Democrat yeah. position. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Right? Is that no. you go to what you go like? I've always argued on the disability side. Do I care you got hurt at work? Or you got a natural condition, or you fell and your you fell out of your driveway. I, I don't care. You can't work because you've got a physical condition. Well, let's deal with that. Let's get you well mm -hmm. so that eventually you can get back to work. And in the meantime, let's make sure that you have adequate income, that you don't go broke as a result of breaking your leg in your driveway, mm -hmm. breaking your leg at work, or you know, breaking your leg while you're downhill skiing, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, you can't work, so let's let's just deal with it, right? And we spend more money trying to figure out, no, it's workers' comp, no, it's LTD, no, it's OW, no, it's CPP. And we, we, we spend all kinds of times trying to deny each other our claims on the basis of you don't fall in the right box. And, and I've always felt that you'd save money by having a more universal system. And I think it would be the same for unemployment, but we need to be careful when we do that because, again, it's a transition, right? There's going to be a lot less people working in that field once we go that way uh, than are working now. Yeah, that I, uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, <laughs> And and I, I think it makes a lot of sense, and I agree. Would you, like, let's say if this was your program you had to develop, would you see it being a similar thing to, let's say, a, a workers' comp where uh, – Okay. Yes, we're give, you get you this basic income level, but we have to try to motivate you to quote unquote get yeah. back to work or 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 input somehow. Well, first of all, most as long as you're doing work. these things. Yeah, but 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 let's let's agree. Most people want to work. Yeah. There's there's you know this whole fallacy that oh if you give people money they'll just stay home and they'll never go to work. Yeah, some people will do that. Some rich people will do that. Some poor people will do that. But by and large, most of us want to work because we're going to go crazy if we don't, right? That's exactly right. <clears throat> I shouldn't use that word, but it's it's essentially what it is. <clears throat> so I think rather than fighting about where you got your injury, we should say, okay, let's make you well. Let's have a transition for you to get back to work. If you can't get back to your regular job, what do we do to train you to do something else? Yeah. And it's not deeming like we got in workers' compensation where we say, <clears throat> you used to be a rocket scientist, and now we're going to make you a security guard, and that rehabilitates you completely. Right? That's not the way that this should work. If you can't be a rocket scientist, we need to find some way of retraining you into something that you can do, right? And and I think <laughs> that it, it, it goes <clears throat> beyond <throat> – beyond, um, injury and 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 those types of things as well yeah. right like i oh, yeah. i think the idea of a of a basic level income sort of comes from the idea that we're we have we're in a rich enough country that we can make sure that nobody falls below a certain floor yeah. right yeah. and yeah. and i totally take your point that there's not <laughs> like it's not that people don't want to work and if any, if anything, what we want is more innovation. And if you allow people that sort of breathing room of not having to worry about the, the, the essentials of their life, you know, putting a roof over their head, putting food on the table, yeah. you give them so much more time and, and brain energy to, yeah. to innovate. Right. And, and, you know, if you have good if you have faith in people in general, that's that's what's going to come out of that. Or you would hope and, and that's most, what's going to come out of And that. most people will do the right thing. Some won't, yeah, but they're the right. minority. Yeah. And we shouldn't let the minority drive our decisions. Of like there's not. other ways of dealing with this stuff, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And it's funny how quick you can see that, uh, you know, the, that whole idea that people are going to take advantage and the scrutiny that comes along with that 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 sort of falls apart in an emergency, right? Like with this uh, CERB, 
there there was this <coughs> idea at first like oh my god they're just giving it to anybody who's who who's claiming it right and then it was about okay yeah there's probably room for fraud here but we're put it we're we're putting our trust in the population that they're just not like people aren't going to take advantage of this if they don't need it and you i know, i think probably, by and large that's probably the case yeah most people are doing it right like i've had how many people have i had phone calls messenger texts and all you know all kinds of stuff saying oh i was off work but now my employer just called me back i don't want to be an overpayment what do i do right most people are pretty pretty honest that way yeah, yeah. so i i i work and 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 in the uh, the other part of it is <clears throat> there's a cost to not doing anything imagine if we didn't have the crb right where we would be today if you don't have a roof over your head and you don't have food on the table it's a very different society out there. So it, it, it's something a government had to do, and I think it was the right thing to do. No, agreed. And people don't seem to to want to consider those alternate realities, right? Like especially when we talked about um, when people were looking to debate the effectiveness <clears throat> of lockdowns, right, or or whatever uh, social yeah, yeah. Uh, social yeah. distancing measures, whatever it was, yeah. stay at home orders. Um, yeah. The the fact that some people would talk about making um, making points like if you stay home or if you tell everybody to stay home, the economy falls apart and that's going to cause more deaths than this virus will, right? Or that we we know we don't know about the virus or whatever, but that's the, <laughs> no no no. Well, I'm I'm just I'm giving the devil his due, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, all right, okay. So like he's the devil. I have to have fun with it. I have to have fun with it. Yeah, so, ahead, so the, the, you know, you have those arguments, but people weren't, weren't considering like, what is your, suppose you do nothing and then a, mm-hmm. a huge portion of the population gets sick at the same time, never mind just your healthcare system being overwhelmed, but also yeah. what does your economy look like when half the people in the province or in the country can't go to work or aren't shopping because they're sick? Never mind They're being told to stay home. They're sick. Yeah, no, I hear you. And, and and one of my fears is what's going on right now is, so if you go back to two months ago in a bit, you know, we had uh, few infections in Ontario. We were talking about, you know, 10, 20, 30 infections a day. And we ended up shutting down the entire province, the entire country and the whole world based on those types of infections. We're now running at about four to 500 a day, Right. So all of a sudden, let's say we open the economy too early and we say, OK, it's OK. You can go to the show. You can uh, you can go to the sports uh, event. You can go do whatever in the park and everybody can you know do what they used to do before. If all of a sudden we start getting reinfections and it starts to cl- climb up again, it's going to be worse than the last time. And we're going to be closed down even longer. Mm-hmm. So the danger for the economy is that if we don't get this right as far as opening in a cautious way, we may actually put the economy at a further risk by having things shut down even worse if all of a sudden it gets away on us. And you look in the United States, uh, and I'm not going to get into the Trump debate. I think we can all agree where Mr. Trump is at. So let's not even talk about that guy. Uh, he's Deal. the president that we. He's the president that we will not name. <laughs> we say we, we will call him the person without a name. Uh, but if you look at Georgia, if you look at Kentucky, you look at uh, different places where they're reopening and their infection rates haven't come down. I hope they're right. I hope that in the in in the end, I'm proven wrong, and a lot of people are proven wrong, and nothing will happen. But I don't I don't think that'll be the case. And I think the danger is, if we open too early, we may end up in a worse spot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think in general here we've been a lot more cautious like the 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 provinces yeah. that are opening up like i i think saskatchewan was uh was the first right like they've they've opened yeah, up just they this past very week. little in the infections yeah. yeah and they were having like single digit infections yeah. Uh, yeah. every day and though and they were even being extremely cautious on that front now i would hey, say this is my wife hey no second. no problem at all hello dear interlude i am on a radio thing i got to let you go <laughs> You what uncle? Where the Great radio? Pod. Oh, I don't know. I'm on. I'm on. I'm live. I'm not going to get into it. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>
She wants to know the name of somebody who got infected with COVID, and I'm not about to have that. Oh, discussion. that's not a yeah, yeah that's not that a good discussion good. to have on a completely unedited podcast. Uh, but somebody, the, a friend of ours, a friend of ours, has been infected, so that's what oh, that was about. Oh no, I'm sorry to yeah. hear that. Yeah, no, it is. It is what it is. Yeah. Well, so anyway, uh, you were saying. Um, yeah, what what I was saying is that the provinces that are opening up, their rates of infection have been very low. But the one exception to this entire thing has been Quebec. And that they've been eyeing uh, opening up. And you spoke earlier about how there's been pushback from parents on the school openings yeah. and that. Yeah. And so they've pushed that back. But what do you make of their like eagerness to open up and get everything going again, uh, despite their their infection rates still being the highest in the country, if I'm not mistaken? It, it's, it's it's amongst the high Ontario and Quebec, depending on the day. Yeah. Uh, I, I've got a couple of I, a couple of different thoughts about that. The first one is uh, I give Ontario some credit. I give Ford some credit here. Ford is trying to find a balance, and if you see, he's moved. You know, he's moved the goalposts a bunch of times, right? So he'll muse about cottage country opening. Then all of a sudden, his officials will get to him and say, no, not a good idea. Here's the reasons why. And all of a sudden, he backs down. So it's good to see that he's listening mm. to people and uh, is not just gut reaction. Because if you remember Ford in the first couple of years, especially the first year, it was just like, I'm right. I'm right all the time. You're all wrong. And I'm just doing what I got to do. Mm -hmm. This time around, I think he kind of likes being liked, if you know what I mean. <laughs> he's going, I, I kind of like, I like the love. Like, you know, this is pretty cool. So he's being a little bit more cautious in the opening. And I think that's a good thing for Ontario is that uh, people, I think, accept it from him more than they would accept it from us or from the liberals because they would see us. Oh, you guys are just, you know, uh, way too cautious and you don't care about the economy and all that kind of stuff. Ford is... I think recognizes that if he gets this wrong, it's it's serious stuff, mm. and and politically it's damaging for him. So I think he understands that. Uh, so I got to hope that in the longer run, in the medium term, he moves at a at a pace that is in check with what's you know what what can be done. Quebec is the interesting one, and I and I wonder if Quebec is at a point where. Economically, Quebec is not able to sustain the hit as hard as Ontario can, right? Our economy is much stronger. Uh, we're in a much different position financially than Quebec. And I wonder to a certain degree if, if Legault is sort of going, if this stays closed any much longer, I'm going to have so much debt, I won't be able, I don't know what to do, right? Yeah. And I wonder if that's what's driving him uh, more than any kind of ideology. Yeah. Uh, or on the flip side, is it because he thinks that there's a return to work movement out there that he has to pay attention to, especially on the right wing? Because mm -hmm. you saw in Michigan and Ontario, different places, you got the extreme right is out there. Oh, you know, open up, open up, open up, right? Did you see Mr. Mr. Sock the other day? Yep. No, well, that, that was hilarious. That was Ooh, Mr. Sock went to Queens Park and was asking yeah, people yeah. like... Hey. Got it. Like, you got a YouTube, Mr. Oh, Sock. I got to see this. Okay. It was, it was actually pretty funny. Oh, uh, yeah. Unless, but, but the point is, there is a movement in the extreme right wing. And I, and I don't say that as a, as, a, as, a, as a shot at Ford, because clearly he's not, like, he's not participated not in this. Like, he calls them kooks, quite frankly. Yeah, uh, yeah. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that yeah. Was... No, but, but, but my point is, there, there is a sense within the right wing. And if you listen to Mr. Shearer, and you listen to Mr. Trump and a few others uh, of that ilk, they seem to think that the public all wants to run back and get back into things and go back no matter what. That's not what we're finding. I did this community town hall uh, Wednesday night. We did polling questions. And, and the polling questions were to try to get a sense of where are the people in Timmins at when it comes to returning to work. When we asked the question different kinds of ways, would you want the economy reopened now? Uh, do you feel safe at work and all of that kind of stuff? People voted overwhelmingly for their health. Hmm. Overwhelming. 80% of people that responded to those, those surveys we did uh, in one form or other were saying, I'm not going back unless it's safe. Yeah. I'm like, let, let's get this right. There was a, there was, I think it was like 
14 or 18 percent of people that were saying, let's open up the economy no matter what. And we're going back right away. I think most of the public gets it. And it's like nobody likes this. I don't like it. I don't, you know, I'd rather be sitting at your at your bar with a beer uh, like I did the last time, which I think is over your your right shoulder. If I got this right. <laughs> it's on the other side of the wall. It's so on the other side. Yeah, of the I'm wall. in the okay. shop right now. So, <laughs> okay, you're in the shop. Okay, and I think most of us would like to be out of this sort of isolation, but I think most of us understand. Let's get it right because otherwise, it could be a really bad thing. Yeah. Yeah, that that and it makes a lot of sense. I I like that that you you know you you mentioned giving Ford credit on that front and um you know I I don't know whether or not it's the fact that he's like liking being liked. He likes he <laughs> likes being liked. I I'm sure he does. He likes, I think it was like, seven months of of you know teacher unions and parents. That's a good point. Him. He's yeah. finally like, you well, know yeah, what no, this is just like. Nice. He had the autism folks after him. He had the, the teachers after him, parents after him, city of Toronto. Like he's picked a fight with everybody in the province. Yeah. Yeah. And all of a sudden, this is a complete reset for him, mm. right? So politically, it's just like all of a sudden he's seen differently. And people are going, like I was just talking to one of my cousins a little while ago. And I I, I think she votes for me. I'm not sure, <laughs> but I think she does. And she was saying, he's actually doing a good job. And I says, I don't disagree with you. Yeah. He's not being radical mm-hmm. in his approach to reopening the economy. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, we'll, and- we'll see. Is he doing as much as he needs to? No, there's a whole bunch of things that he should be doing. And we can talk about that later. But he's not being the old Mr. Ford. Yeah, and it's in the, you made a good point earlier that maybe to some extent he can like – he can sort of get away with some of this too politically because yeah. he's not like nobody can make the argument that he doesn't care about the economy. Like no, nobody yeah. can sit there and say, Oh, well, M- Mr. Ford's politics yeah. don't line up with the fact that, you know, they're not business oriented or business. It's favorable, like Nixon right? going to China. Yes, exactly. It's, exactly. it's essentially Nixon going to China. So for all of those who don't know what we're talking about, Nixon's cut his teeth fighting communists back in the Eisenhower days in the 1950s. And eventually when he became president, he essentially opened up discussions with China and warmed up relationships between China and the United States. And he always said only Nixon could have done that. Right? Yeah, because nobody Cause, else, everybody else would have been accused of being a communist. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right. Exactly. If, if and it, and Carter would have done it, it would have been oh, another, you know, oh my the, God. The socialist. If would have done it, they would have, they had to die. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but well, like so, r- real quick, just a side note. Do you think that? Do you think it was? Uh, like I don't know if if, if Nixon thing. Now that was all. That was hundred percent all. I don't know if it was all financial or was it to create more of a tripolar world because realizing that the Chinese communists were very much separate from the Soviet communists and saying like you know what, let's support these guys to pull away from the Soviets. But that's there the is. I've read some really good books, and a lot of them have to do around the Vietnam War, because you got to remember that the Chinese were supporting the North Vietnamese, and so were the Russians, but they had very different uh, agendas. We'll just leave it that way. Yeah. And and Trump was trying to find a way to separate off the Russians from the from the Chinese, so that was part of it. But I think I think in fairness to Nixon, he understood how can you ignore at that time a country of 800 million people. That's a huge economy. Now it's over yeah. a billion, right? Yeah. Yeah. Be careful, Mr. Mr. Nixon, for what you ask for, because you might get it. And now they're living with a very prosperous Chinese economy that's doing, quite frankly, a lot better than people want. Yeah. But it just is it better because just because they're 1.3 billion? You know, like if you look at well, the capita, they're still it, super I think, low. Listen, I, 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 I think there's a whole bunch of reasons why the Chinese have done well. They've got cheap labor, you know. You know where where's where's where do we send most of our manufacturing uh, in Canada? We send it to Mexico, China, India, Pakistan, and why do we do that? Is because we can get cheaper labor, and we wonder because the consumers want to buy goods at a cheaper product. So companies are saying, okay, I'm going to do that. I don't agree. I think it's wrong. And it's interesting that President Trump, the man who will not be named, <laughs> is the guy except for now, who's railing against. Uh, internationalism, mm-hmm. right? Because you know, like he has his get Donald electric Trump hats done in China for God's sakes, right? Yeah. We've seen that. Yeah. Uh, but but it's interesting that the right wing is railing against 
internationalism much more than the left wing is. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an interesting situation. Well, there there seems to be a point on both those sides of the political spectrum where you meet up with at the anti globalization kind of uh, um, I don't know. They, they, it sort of becomes a circle, right? The the political spectrum uh, meets in the middle and ends up being, and it always ends up being that sort of anti globalist sentiment, right? Yeah. Well, and, and, and for, for different reasons, I think what we're learning through this COVID-19 crisis, there's certain things that our jurisdiction has to do and not be dependent on others, right? The, the production of PPEs, right? We're now learning that it's not a good idea to be dependent on China and the United States and Europe in order to get our PPEs. And so we are now moving towards uh, trying to be able to produce. In fact, we're working with a, uh, an entrepreneur in Timmins who's looking at uh, developing a plant here in Timmins in order to do PPEs, right? And it's moving along. We're, 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 it's, it's actually been pretty exciting working on that particular project with the city and, and others. So international, yes, but not necessarily internationalism. There's certain things we need to do ourselves. And it's not just PPEs, but there's certain things your economy has to be able to do itself. And, and I think this is one of the things that we're learning through this COVID-19 crisis. I, you know, I, 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 can't, I, I 100% agree. And I don't agree with a lot. I like to think I'm always right, but I'll agree with you this time. Uh, I thought you were left, not right. I am left. Okay. <laughs> but He's it's right. because <laughs> when, when you talk about talk about that, you know, like things we have to do in-house, like uh, nationally or, or provincially, and, you know, like when we look at the dairy industry, the dairy industry and a lot of uh, uh, agriculture is always like it has to be 80 percent, you know, uh, you know, with domestic or blah, blah, blah. Do you see, because of this issue, a much larger push towards expanding that, you know, you might call it bread basket, but with, for other products as well? Because obviously now we, obviously we're going to need more PPE done in-house because we can't rely on the other countries. Do you see other things maybe expanding? And do you think, do you, do you see p potential uh, government legislation pushing towards that to, to like cement that? <laughs> That, that, that'll be an interesting one, because if you look at milk, as you know, milk is uh, it's a supply management system, right? And just so people understand what supply management is, if we got rid of supply management, most of your milk would come from the United States, mm. right? Frank Hassan, who has a milk farm down on uh, by my daughter's place, probably would have a difficult time trying to operate in that kind of environment, because if you didn't have a milk farm of 10,000 cows, you probably wouldn't make it, Right. So in Ontario and across Canada, we have what they call supply management. So we say, how much milk does the Ontario market need? And then we source that milk to Ontario producers. So it's like, that's why we still have a pretty strong, resilient uh, dairy industry across Ontario, is because we do have supply management that makes sure that the farmer is able to operate and make a profit and we can buy safe milk, and that's a key, uh, that's tested and all that kind of stuff at a reasonable price. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think there is a place for supply management when it comes to different type of things that we need to supply each other with, especially in the food industry, right? Mm. Um, so I, I think, you know, are we going to go more there? I think there's a few more steps in between. Uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's, there's crop insurances and various type of, uh, I forget what it's called now, I don't have the term in front of me, but when a uh, beef farmer or a pork farmer or a poultry farmer finds themselves in a situation where, you know, the market is gone and they're, they're gone, there's insurances against that uh, so that they don't go under. We're going to have to make sure that our food industry is kept whole because if we lose some of these operators, they won't come back up yeah. again. Yeah. Right. And we need them because in the longer run, we don't want to be buying all of our beef and poultry from, you know, Argentina or Australia or wherever it might be coming from. And and I, I take your point of needing to make sure that we're sus we can sustain ourselves, especially yeah. in a crisis situation. My cons or my question, especially when you talk about things like supply management, is at what point does that become protectionism? And at w and well, it is. It, well, no, and I understand that it is protectionism, and it's it's sort of the what. Uh, the anti-global economy, right? It's it's sort of pushing back against the idea that we're just going to have open commerce, free trade across the world. 
But, but how's that working for us? But the, but that's that's my point. It, 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 <laughs> in an economic sense, it really hasn't. But you know, there's arguments to be made to say that it's been one of the reasons why the world has been relatively at peace for the oh. because we've relied on each on each other. Yeah, so like I, the, I think you're you're, you're from an economic point of view. Yeah, I think you're right from a security point of view. An integrated economy makes it very much against all of our interests to fight. Exactly. I don't disagree with you. I agree with you on that one. But I think what the, the balance that we have to find as nations uh, is that we have to figure out to what degree are we prepared to offshore much of our production for things that we need here in our own country, in our own province. Yeah. And I think those are perfectly good questions to ask ourselves. And I would argue in the food industry, I think there's a very good argument to be made that as much of our food should be grown as close to home as we can mm -hmm. for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. And if you have, you know, imagine if we were completely dependent on beef from the United States or Argentina, and all of a sudden their big mega plant that supplies Canada gets shut down because of whatever, we'd be in a hell of a situation. That's right. You know, we're still doing okay in Canada when it comes to supply of meat because most of our production actually goes into the states right especially on the beef side right okay yeah no that 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 makes sense yeah. And, and and I mean so, I I guess it's a debate that has to be had with arguments being heard from all sides and they, you strike a balance right like like you mentioned well it has to be a balance and it you know things are not going to be the way they were in nineteen in the nineteen fifties we can't go back to that right uh, the world only moves forward so we have to figure out ways uh, to be able to say all right how do we make sure that we create an economy that works for people and that's really the question the economy should just not work for those on the top it should also work for those at the bottom. And that's where, as a social democrat, as a new democrat, I, I differ from my conservative friends because they tend to think, oh, well, you know, it's all about if the guy at the top can make all of the money, it's all going to trickle down. Well, you know, trickle down, nothing comes down. It normally stays up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we need to find ways so that anybody who wants to try to make a million bucks should be able to try to make a million bucks. And if they make a million bucks, that they have some social responsibility. Yeah. And and I don't think like you you hear that and it it doesn't sound like an unreasonable thing to to. Well, that's they you told know, you to you should have been a social democrat years ago. <laughs> but you will be converted. Uh, per, perhaps, perhaps. One, perhaps. I would. With one vote. I have a hard time considering myself a, a a conservative or anything for that matter. But when when I hear that, it doesn't sound. When I have fun with you. It's always good. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> and and I think there you know to again give the devil his due is just the idea that theoretically the idea that a rising tide lifts all boats does make sense but it it cases. just doesn't see there seems to always be some workaround some loophole to be had where you know it, it just it, the, well you see it right if you if you yeah. look at it from a macro point of view Basically, the inequality is just growing. We're, we're, we're all rising together. Yes, that's true. Standard of living tends to be rising across the board. But the inequality between the top and the bottom is getting much, much yeah. wider. Yeah. And, it's, and we need to find a way to make sure that, it's like that, that we don't leave too many people behind. That we, the, the big part in making the economy work and making society work is people got to feel as if they're part of it. They can make it. If people at the bottom feel that they can make a couple of bucks and maybe one day get rich, that's a good thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, we need to understand we have a social responsibility to each other. And you just can't have companies going out there doing what the hell they want or individuals doing what they want and not uh, being socially responsible to people around them. Well, it's funny because I teach taxation. And I always find this is an interesting thing is – People assume like, oh, if I make another dollar or for, like I paid half of my my paycheck to taxes. And it's like, well, no, that's wrong. First of all, like that's that's not how <laughs> not that true. works. But then if you teach them like marginal tax rate, if you get to the highest level of, of income in the tax bracket for federal and provincial, you only pay at, at, at highest end 46 percent marginal tax rate. That means for every new dollar you bring in, you lose 46 cents of that dollar, but you still get. 56 cents and i don't know about you i'm a 
yes, I'm a new Democrat, I would argue, but I'm a capitalist too, and I want money. Yeah, we all and are. I know that every more dollar I make, the more money I like. If I make a dollar, I'm bringing fifty six cents home. I'm going to keep fighting to get that, even if it was fifty fifty. I'm going to keep trying to get that fifty cents coming in. So we're going to have to have a show where I'm going to share something I've been working with the financial accountability officer on, and that is, what do you get for your taxes? You know. Uh, it would always fascinates me when I have conversations with my friends on the left and the right. Doesn't matter if you're a new Democrat or conservative. I don't want to pay taxes. Okay, fine. I want to make uh, I want to make a bill that you can opt out. You know, you don't want to pay taxes. That's it. You pay zero taxes. But that means to say you're going to pay for everything that happens. Yeah. So when you drive down the highway, you're going to pay a toll. When the fire department shows up at your house, you're going to pay with your credit card. When the cop comes to your door because there's some incident, you're going to have to pay. When you go to the hospital, you're going to have to pay. When your kid goes to school, you're going to have to pay. So the point is, when you total up the amount of money that we get back as a result of pooling, we pay our taxes, which means to say we pool our money together in order to do some things in common. The average citizen is way ahead doing that than if they had to do it privately. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I always use this as the one example I have a uh, neighbor down just that away, all right, uh, who uh, was in Florida about three, four years ago and had a pretty serious incident, a health incident, ended up in a hospital for about 10, 12 days in ICU. I get a phone call from his wife and, uh, you know, he's not doing well and, my God, what are we going to do, this, that, and the other thing, and then he starts to get better. So I, I says to her, I said, listen, do me a favor. When this is all over and you check out of the hospital, make sure to get a copy of the entire hospital bill because it was paid by her private insurance. So she gave me a copy of the actual invoice that there were two invoices, one for medical services, one from the hospital. The total invoice was $565,000 when you total them both up. So I took them and I gave them to Blaze McNeil at the hospital. How much do you think that same service would have cost in Ontario. And 565000 versus... 35. $27,000. All right. Wow. So it's a lot cheaper to do things in common. When we put our dollars together and we say, no child in Ontario is going to go to school up to grade 12 and have to pay. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, that costs a lot of money, but it's cheaper if we do it together. Yeah. We are going to build the roads together. You're not going to have a toll road on every highway. Imagine if we had toll roads. Our tolls in northern Ontario would be higher than southern Ontario, right? Because we have less people. Uh, our healthcare system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm actually getting the, the financial accountability officer to do some costing of, on average, how much does the average citizen get back from the taxes they pay federally and provincially? And what I've seen so far is we're far ahead of the United States. Mm. Well, they talk about health care percentage yeah. of income uh, paid in the states to health care on average compared to what we pay in taxes that goes to health services. Yeah. We pay a much lar- a smaller percentage. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, and right now in the states, they're talking about that during, you know, it's election time. They're talking about, you know, like there's different plans, single payer systems. Yeah. And the argument is, hey, let's pool it together. So we all buy medicine from one place, make it cheaper because we buy in bulk, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, there a lot of their plans are little yeah. crap, but is it the, the the theory is there, it, and they can just look up here. Even though they, you know, they always argue, oh, go get health care in Canada, be even worse. But like, not really. Oh yeah, you can't, you can't get, you know, you can't get doctors in Canada. It's true. I, I, that's what I've heard. I have I have an uncle who's since passed away, and and he swore to God that if he ever got sick in Canada, that he would die because he couldn't get a doctor. That he couldn't get did a he, doctor. Did he pass? He, he passed away in the United States, and he did, get, he did have a doctor. No, no, but it just, <laughs> they, they, like, he was a good Republican, right? He's from Philadelphia. But anyways. Uh, Patriot. But, the, but there's, it's ingrained, right? It's ingrained that their system is better and ours is worse, and they believe it, right? It's unfortunate. Yeah, and, and I mean. I always try to, because to to me in in my head, I, I sort of try to refuse to believe that smart people 
are not smart you know like there's a lot of smart people that argue from from all these perspectives from both sides. exactly from both. and and you yeah. sort of have to wonder like sometimes you feel so convinced with your argument that you feel like you need to at least get some your mind wrapped around the other the other person or the other side's argument and what what seems to me to be the case is that it, it depends on the measure right like when we talk about quality of healthcare in canada versus like the united states they talk like we talk a lot about access the fact that and like regardless of of um of where you are what you what you have like you'll be able to have access and then when the united states talks about healthcare most of the time when they're talking about the quality they hi- they like to highlight things like outcomes right so not with the understanding that only certain people with certain amounts of money are getting like really uh. great outcomes on certain really rare diseases and that might very well be the case right yeah there's but, cases in the states where the services will be superior but there'll be cases in canada where our services are superior depends on what you got right yeah uh, yeah. yeah so let, let me get back to the covid19 thing so we don't uh get too get far. away from one of the things that i i wanted to talk about and that is and and, and i'm asking myself the question and i'm probably going to get in trouble here. this is our show here yes <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask a question to myself. So one of the things that I, I, I listen to people on, like I watch social media and listen to what people have to say, it's like, you know, the, on the one hand, people will say, you know, we can't afford to do all this thing, you know, giving people $2,000 a month and money for this and money for that. How are we going to pay for it? My, my first observation, I find it interesting, is a lot of people who are saying that at the same time are asking for those monies. Which I which I I just think is interesting. I just leave it at that. Yeah. But on the flip side, I think there's two things that I want to say, and just to spur off this discussion is, if we did nothing, where would we be? Yeah. Right? Yeah. If people didn't have money for groceries and you know the things that they have to do, where would we be after two or three months? Would that be a good thing? I think not. Uh, the second thing is, can we afford it? And I and I was talking to somebody a couple of nights ago, and they were really irate about this particular issue. So I called the, the person up, and he's going, oh, this, that, and that, and this, and that, and debt and that. And I'm saying, there's not a country in the world that's not getting in debt right now. So let's let's put all this into context. The United States is far ahead of us when it comes to the amount of debt that they're putting forward as a result of COVID-19, and they're not doing as much as we are. But that's a whole other story, right? But the other thing is, is that you also have to remember there are parts, there are times in our history where governments have racked up huge amounts of debt in order to deal with the crisis of the day. And at the end of the day, we found the money to do it because it was the right thing to do. Mm. And we, we, we ended up working it out. We paid it back. You know, I always remember my dad. My dad grew up in the Depression. And he, he was a young man in 1941, 42, whenever he joined the armed for the army, uh, in order to do what he had to do. Uh, he said, "You know what? The whole time we were in the depression, they didn't have money to help people, but they had billions of dollars to buy tanks, planes, and everything else. And then we went out and did what we had to do, and we beat back uh, Hitler and you know uh, the, the Japanese and all that stuff, and we won the Second World War and." Everything worked out after it. It was a big boom. He said there was more going on in the economy in the 1950s and 60s as a result of those expenditures uh, than, than you can shake a stick at. So I, I just say to people, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater because the cost of doing nothing is much more expensive. Yeah. Because then people, if they're not eating and they're not paying the rent, uh, they're going to be doing that in their own way, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And you're absolutely right because like – and people don't – don't think about it. We are a G7 nation. We have one of the highest uh, and best, sorry, not the highest, one of the best interest rates to, Mm -hmm. if we want to borrow money. Uh, But even then, who's going to call our debt? The largest percentage of our debt is owned by the taxpayer in Canada. Huge percentage. You know, and they always talk about the states, you know, all their debts owned by China. It's much, a huge majority of it is owned by the taxpayer in the states. So who's going to call the debt? China's in debt now, or they're taking debt out to do this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Who's yeah. going to call the debt? It's, yeah. We're kind of, like you said, everyone's doing this across the world. We're all yeah. on the same playing field. 
like yeah. what's really going to happen. So is Europe, China, India, uh, you know, Asia and us yeah. going to call each other like, no, like at the end of the day, we're going to have to do what we're going to do. Is it a problem? Absolutely. Mm. But it's what you got to do in this circumstance, right? Yeah. And it's only over- overcome with like later on with an increase in economic activity and so on. Yeah. And hopefully that's what's going to kind of spur out of this. And it's, mm. you're right. It, I think it comes down to people's perception of it, right? Like people sort of get married to a concept and they, they stop being pragmatic and, uh, and dealing with things in context, right? Like you sort of get this idea that, because it's, it's very true that, all like long gone are the voices of most people who are talking about, you know, austerity and, uh, um, especially now that this, this crisis is here, right? Like Mm -hmm. those, those voices aren't very popular right now. They, because Mm -hmm. real people are losing money on this front and there's nobody to pin this on, right? (laughs) Or the socialist. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. No kidding. But there's also nobody to pin this on. I think this is another one. Like, um, That's an interesting point, actually. Yeah, like uh, the idea. Uh, I, I think you had a, a big backlash to things like when the the states bailed out the banks uh, in two thousand eight, right? That you had a lot of anger that came out of that because, and and sure, you could have that same argument. What happens if nothing gets done at that point? No bailouts yep. made. No money's injected into the economy. Are we worse off? Are we better off? Well, at the very least, there's somebody like some people look at that and say these people did wrong, and we want to see them punished, not rewarded, right, or not saved. So that can spark some kind of debate here. But in this situation, a whole bunch of people are hurting, and nobody can really make an argument to say like the the worst thing you can say is uh, oh well this is all the government's fault. All this economic problem is the government's fault because they told people to stay home. Well, they told people to stay home so they didn't get sick and we didn't, we didn't, uh, uh, you know, uh, screw up our public health and perhaps our economy as well, right? Yeah. So there's nobody Justin's to pin fault. this on. Sorry. It's Justin's okay. fault. It's all Justin's, Justin's fault. We agree. Yeah. It's all Justin's fault. Let's agree with that. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's always a default, right? Yeah. Comfortable I, position I do, to be I in. do find it interesting, the... Uh, Anyways, I, I want no, no, never mind. I'm not going to go down this path. <laughs> okay, carry on. I think we want to hear this. Now. Uh, oh, I, I, I had a feeling you, you were maybe going to get tempted into some conspiracy theory talk, but uh, oh, I guess no, not. No, no, no I'm not. A, how, I'm not a conspiracy kind of guy. No, that's not me. Uh, Michelle, how God. do you deal? How do you deal with that when it, like I have a hard time right now seeing people? You know, people have been posting this pandemic bull crap for however long and i'm having a point where like i was deleting people off my facebook because i just can't deal with it and now i'm seeing people who actually kind of for the longest time you know had some level of of uh appreciation for or respect for and they're getting into doing this how like on your side how do you deal with that because like obviously you have to steal you have to represent these people they are still your constituency regardless Mm -hmm. if they vote for you or not how do you even respond to these things that you might believe are are demonstrably false how do you get like i i think a couple of things that you know i've only been doing this about 30 years right <laughs> <laughs> uh the one thing that i've learned over the years you got to listen to people yeah. it, it's it, the politics is not complicated is that you really have to listen to people you have to make sure that they know you're listening but they're okay if you disagree with them Mm-hmm. So, like I, I, like I get on the phone about eight, eight, eight thirty in the morning, and I go to about four or five in the afternoon. So I talk to a lot of people during the course of the day who have emailed me, contacted me, messengered me, whatever. And I'm, I, I tend to do stuff by phone because I find it's just a lot better, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I get people to call and say, "Oh, this is all." Not a lot of people, but I get some people to call and say, "Oh, this is all conspiracy, this, that, and the other thing," like you're saying. And and you listen to what they have to say. You you got to let people say what they got to say, and then you got to accept what they're saying as what they believe. And then don't be afraid to disagree, like and, and be respectful. So I'll say, well, like really, like you know, sorry, I see it differently. Uh, you know, here are the reasons why. And 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 eventually, I find most people are pretty reasonable. I think the big problem that we're having. Uh, these days, uh, it's not different than before, but it's accelerated. The problem with social media, a lot of people believe what they see on social media, 
as being the you know the, the the truth and the reality is is a lot of it is bs there's a lot of stuff on social media left and right you know uh pro uh shutting down the economy con shutting down the economy which is complete bs right mm -hmm. and and unfortunately because some people see it they think it's true and so they make it the you know the, it becomes the it becomes the the you know the truth for them but but again, I I think it's a question is that we have to hear each other, you know. At the end of it, in a civil society, if you don't hear each other, then you're not getting anywhere. So you got to listen to each other. Yeah. And, and at the end, we may not agree. Like I've had some people that I've called over the last couple of days who, who have said to me, "Well, you know, I think Joe, they should open the economy today." And I say, "Well, you know, that is your right, and you believe in what you do, and I understand that, but." Uh, if you're asking me, do I think it should be opened right away? No, I think we need to be cautious. And I think we need to do this in a way that we don't put lives at risk. But more importantly, if we get it wrong, the economy is going to be closed that much longer. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. And I, I take your point. I, I, I feel like I appreciate hearing that, that, that there are some people that are making those, um, how can I say, they're having... Uh, they're having these kind of uh, – they're being tempted into dis discussing or, or um, uh, believing some of the, this conspiracy stuff. And they're, po you know, they're sharing a lot of it and, and you, you have to listen to where they're coming from on that front. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think what's, what's difficult about it is I, and what's almost equally as painful as seeing somebody share something that, that is just completely false is sometimes the reaction that comes of it. And we, we talked about this when we had uh, Mark uh, Durapool from Dabrowski's there. He came on and right yeah. before he came on some, somebody had posted a video of themselves and it was a um, local business owner who was not open and was really co was was making a, a heartfelt plea basically saying like th this this is not really happening we should not be closing down we want to move forward with with uh with opening up and um sort of advocating on disobey on disobedience right on this front mm -hmm. and <clears throat> Our comment at that point was, or the comments that you would see on that post was a lot of hate, right? And a lot of like, look at this crazy person, doesn't know what, what they're saying and like doesn't, uh, can, can you believe this stuff? That. Yeah, and it was a lot of ridicule. And to me, I, I just sort of asked myself the question, like, has anybody been ever been ridiculed out of their position? Right, like no one's oh, ever been embarrassed <laughs> out of a. <laughs> but but to me, to me, but but oh, you gotta learn, you gotta learn not to. You can't take it to heart. No, but you also can't like, especially today with the internet, because it's so easy for somebody to silo themselves into an echo chamber of only hearing stuff that will reinforce that opinion. I think we need to meet it with exactly what you were talking about: is empathy and listening. Right, because that person, it's not about them not believing in this being a virus or anything like that. It's about them having real financial pain because their business is suffering and they're they don't feel like they're having the support. And this is an easy answer. It's an easy thing to to fall into. Yep. Yeah. And 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 people get in, in that case. I would imagine what happened with that person. He or she. It was like I'm hurting. I'm going to lose a whole bunch of stuff and I'm trying to figure out the best way I can to be able to survive. And right. this is the best I can come up with, you know, yeah. who knows what happens after. Right. Yeah. So it is, but, but you have to have empathy. And I, I, like I, I, you know, listen, I, I have people call me names and, uh, you know, uh, say things on Facebook about me and all that stuff. And, uh, I always have fun. I call them because oh. what people don't realize you, you can call a person on Facebook pretty easily, right? Uh, so I'll call and I'll say, hi, hey, Jill, how's it going? And and Jason will say, who? who, who, who <laughs> who's Joe Biso? And I'll say, yeah, yeah, I'm just giving you a call. I saw you posted something. I thought I'd just give you a call. And, oh, I, 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 did, I really didn't mean it because most people are decent, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and then you have a chat with the person and you find out there's something else going on in the background. A- They've never been a new Democrat and they hate us with a passion and, you know, they have their own political beliefs. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. You don't have to agree with me. You don't have to be a new Democrat. Uh, we just need to be civil to each other. Other times, the person is going through something, right? People are upset because 
they've lost something or something's happened in their lives that turned things upside down. And I find if you just call people and chat with them and you listen to what they have to say, that's half of the battle. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, they may not agree with me, but at least you hear them out, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you're co- you're all coexisting uh, peacefully, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that, sometimes, it's... Not easy, sometimes not easy to take, but you deal with it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say uh, that's I, I'm I'm um, spouting an ideal that this podcast doesn't always live up to. <laughs> we we have talked our share of shit. So uh, <laughs> no, I can't uh, believe that. Not you. No, not on the beer and bullshit podcast, right? <laughs> no, cool. but I guess uh, if uh, we're all in the spirit of all working on ourselves, that's something we should all be we should all be trying to do more of, right? Yeah, and let's remember, none of us are perfect, right? Yeah, exactly. We we all make mistakes along the way, and we try to do the best we can. That's all you can do at the end of the day, right? Yeah, and maybe and this this kind of thing, uh, the the fact that everybody's been forced to sort of get on the internet a little bit more, is exposing everybody, right? It's it, yeah. it's sort of making everybody a little bit more vulnerable. Not not everybody gets to to hide behind whatever persona they're creating. And I think yep. that's been a little bit the the complaint about politics in the past is that it you know pol- politicians have their carefully crafted personas and they they sort of are, are at each other's throats from. Uh... I didn't shave. <laughs> Look at me. I don't have a persona. For God's sake, I got a t-shirt on. You're a pi- you're a pioneer, Jill, coming on this uh, extremely informal <laughs> podcast and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and well, chat with uh... us. But yeah, you know, it's, uh, I find I find people are good though. The long and the short of the story is, even when people are mad, people aren't mad at you. They're just mad at their situation, and you try to deal as best as you can. Yeah. All right, that's right. I gotta say, Corey, I'm not sure if you have more to say. No, no, I'm no gonna, way. Absolutely. I'm gonna jump in and. Keep I'm gonna get another beer if you guys don't mind. Go oh yeah, go get your beer. I'm gonna have uh, wine now. Can I have my wine finally? Have your wine. I'm I'm uh, actually right now. Uh, I did have the the hipster beer from. Uh, oh yeah. Compass, yeah. the hibiscus. Yeah. I really, really. That's probably my my go to at Compass. But yeah. I switched over to the uh, anything goes the sour at Compass. Oh, you like the sours? Eh? I <laughs> love the sours. I love See, I'm not I'm not big on that. Yeah, anyway, anyway, I go yeah. from this this the the sours to the stouts. I'm I'm like the two extremes on the beer. Uh, you know. I guess uh, range, uh, whereas like you know like the IPAs, whatever. I'm okay with them, but yeah. yeah. But uh, I was going to say, uh, it was kind of like you were talking about listening to people and, and taking taking what people have to say. But like the one thing I noticed, and I've, I've spoken about this with Corey, and I've said it on the podcast before. So as some people may know, I decided the one time I ran for, for municipal council, which was a, a, a travesty of itself. No, uh, it wasn't. It was a good thing <laughs> for you to do. Oh, it was great. Actually, I learned a lot. But, but it is funny because like, I did that, but I've done door knocking with you. And mm-hmm. I've done door knocking with Charlie. Yeah. And there is one thing I learned, and uh, I didn't notice it when I first did, because I first did door knocking with you guys, and then I did my own, and then I went back to do door knocking with you guys, because you guys have done a few more elections yeah. than I have. Yeah. Uh, and I remember the thing is, like, when I would go knock on doors, I had a hard time of putting my foot down and being like, this is my position. And when somebody would come to me and start going off on these rants about whatever, you know, I would try to listen and try to be open, but like I was always afraid to save my my peace. But I've seen you know guys like like you and Charlie. Okay, really the only two other guys I've seen door knocking. But essentially, I've heard you say, "I get that," but here you go. This is why we believe this. This is what it is. And I've seen I there and I really appreciated it. And I thought like, oh, you know what? They no regardless of what's going on. They talk. You know, they will stick with their point of view. They won't placate. And I find like a a populist uh, politician would just try to say like, you know what? Yeah, we got to work on that and not really give their point of view. But I did see Charlie one time on the phone, and I'm giving him full props. Somebody was arguing about people on welfare getting their their, their <coughs> about their, their rent money and you know they're getting two thousand or they're getting a thousand dollars and Charlie just pretty well laced into him saying if you think in Timmins you can get a good apartment for under a thousand dollars and still have enough money to pay for food and for this and for that, you're crazy. He's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're upset with this, but th- <laughs> we crazy. can't talk anymore about this. Like I'm try and like he tried and tried, but this person kept going. But he just put his foot down, and then I would realize, like, you know what? 
I want to emulate essentially, you know, maybe not all in, in all political uh, ideologies, but like if I'm going to, to if I'm not going to endure, I'm not doing the populist uh, like, oh, I don't want to get this person mad. It's like, no, I have to stand by my beliefs. And I found you and Charlie have done that very well when I've, yeah, I've watched you guys. Yeah, it's the only way you can survive. You, you yeah. can't you can't go to one door and say one thing, go to the next door and say the other thing. Otherwise, you'll be a liberal. <laughs> oh, did I say that? Oh, oh sorry. That was oh, good. That was good. Oh, that was, that was good. Oh, I'm, I'm We've sorry. had liberals on the show, so. <laughs> no, I, I listen. I, I, I've been. Uh, I got to tell you, ninety-nine percent of the people at the door are fine. They actually are. Every now and then, you get somebody who's not. And I, I, I my, my, you know, I, I've got some favorite canvassing stories, but I've had people like that who take off on a tangent and there's just no way that they're going to, uh, you know, they, they see things very, very differently. And at one point you just got to say, well, listen, I'm going to disagree. And you know what? You should be voting conservative or liberal because that's not what I stand for. Have a great day. And if you want, I'll go get you a sign, you know, and, and I've done that a couple of times. And I don't mean, I don't mean it as a bad thing because it's a democracy. If people disagree with me, that's the way it is, right? Yeah. I have to accept that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Like, there's no, uh, th- there's no way that you're going to sit there and and you you realize it, right? Like when there's some people yeah. that are just never going to see it the same way as you, and and there's like you say, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's like you also got to think of like how are you going to think of yourself as you leave that interaction, right? If you, if all you did was say whatever that person wanted to hear in that moment, like, I I don't know how, how many different stories you got to tell to how many different people and how much you got to maintain, but you got to be an exceptionally good liar. If you're going to cover for all of those stories, right? I got to I got to tell you a story that dates back many, many years. Do you remember a guy by the name of David Ramsey? Yeah. David yeah. So, so David ran for the NDP in Temiskaming Cochrane right. in the early 1980s. And I was working for the union then, so I was going through Temiskaming Cochrane, and uh, they asked me to pop in and do some door knocking. So I went door knocking with the, can- with the candidate. And after going an evening door knocking with the candidate, there was like five different positions on each issue, depending what door we knocked on. And I remember as a joke, going back to the campaign manager, which will go unnamed. I, uh, she's, she's, I'm not going to mention her name. And I says, uh, I think her candidate's a liberal. She goes, <laughs> no, 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 no. He's a new Democrat. And I says, oh, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. And he ended up walking over. Damn it. <laughs> he did? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he walked over to the liberals under Peter. It was under... Uh, yeah, under it was it Peterson. Yeah, under Peterson, in nineteen eighty-seven or eighty-five. Eighty-five. But see, these people can't last, right? Like, whenever well, he lasted, he lasted twenty some odd years. This guy. See, but but I mean, like, they, <laughs> sure they'll last independently. But what I mean is their their impacts won't last because no. they're they're not really there doing anything, and they're if anything, it, they're sort of the mm-hmm. underlying poison that people find distasteful about politics right it's the idea that there's some kind of self-interested career politician somebody who just is in it for themselves and will say whatever I, I, will get I, I, them I ahead if it's a question, i don't know if it's a question if he was in it for himself i think this is a okay i'm going to be very honest with you this is a very scary job mm-hmm. Let, let's let's be real when Jason put his name on a ballot to say, I'm going to run for municipal council, or I put my name on a ballot to run for, uh, for provincial, uh, for provincial uh, office, it's, it's a scary thing, right? And, and you want to be loved, and you want to be respected, and you want people to like you. And so it's, it's, it's not a big stretch for somebody to go to a door and say, yeah, I agree with you, I agree with you, I agree with you, because they haven't delivered, they haven't developed the political maturity to be able to say, well, no, actually... I respect what you say, but I see it differently. And it's not, I don't think it's because they're trying to be dishonest. I really don't. I think it's because it's a fear of actually being upfront about what you believe in because you may end up losing support. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just got to accept that some people aren't going to vote for you. That's interesting. I find that very interesting to hear that because I I don't feel like I've I've ever heard that perspective on about somebody who's presenting themselves for office, but that the 
the point you made about lack of political maturity and not necessarily even having their own ideas form formulated and well, you being, not. you know, you and not. just sort of being influenced by wherever the wind is blowing. Right. And that could change from door to door if you're door knocking. Right. Oh, I remember so. when I first ran in 1990, it was a, it was an absolutely terrifying thing to do. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, I had most of what I figured out who I am politically at that time figured out, but there's a lot of stuff I saw at the door that I went, Ooh, God, I never saw that one before. Right. So you, you got to remember, you know, politicians are human beings that are running for office. And so they're in, in, you know, I should say it the other way, uh, it's individuals that are running for office politically, I guess is the way I should have said it. And uh, it's, it's, it's a scary thing. It really is. And, I, and I've run, this is my eighth election. And quite frankly, it's scary every time. Not that you're going to get defeated, you know, because you accept at one point that it's going to be the will of the voter one way or another. And, but it's, it's a scary thing in the sense that you're going out there and you're putting yourself out for a selection and you've got to get a majority of people to vote for you. It's it's not an easy thing to do. I uh, you were talking about like you know uh, uh, Ramsey crossing a floor, yeah. and I've always I've, I've always thought about that. And you hear people say like, oh you know oh Jill's just uh, cross the floor so we can be in, in on the winning side and be on, on be in power or Charlie should cross the floor. The winning side. We're doing okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but doing this and that and they, you know to say all that stuff, but it's like. It's funny because I always think about like, would I respect somebody who would cross the floor? And I, th I think sometimes I find myself on both sides of that uh, on the arguments that where I'd be like, you know what? If Jill was completely against, actually, we'll keep you out. We'll say Charlie. We'll say we'll throw that guy under the bus. Uh, that, oh, that you can throw me under the bus. I'm fine. We'll throw Chuck. Okay. So let, let's <laughs> so let's say Charlie uh, crosses crosses the floor uh, for a reason. The way I would have to look at it is like, is he crossing for political points or did he really believe on a certain stance where his party was opposite? And, you know, and I would I, I have kind of the hard time saying, like, if he just crossed to go be with the liberals. Uh, yes, you know, like just switching parties seems like a weird shift. But if you he would vote against his party because of a. a a political ideology and belief that he really has and believing that it's better for his constituency because we are entrusting him or you to make the decision on our power, our part. Like I was, if it was, that was the reason because he was making a decision because it's the best for his people. I'd be okay with it. But like, I think it'd be hard to, to dissect that or to, to separate those two. Like, you know, like, so if you, if you shifted, he went to, you know, Oh, I'm, I'm following uh, good old uh, Mr. Ford, you know, like, how would that? I, I think it'd be a hard time for you to get. It'd be hard for you to get reelected <laughs> next way around. But you know, like, do you? Well, I, I, but, but I, you know, it, it just my observation of people that have crossed the floor, they very seldom cross them for those reasons. Hmm. It normally is they're mad at their leader, they're mad at their caucus uh, over a particular issue or a lack of respect that they feel that they're not getting, yeah. and it becomes personal issues. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't respect that. Yeah. No, but that, but, but I'm not going to get into names, but I've seen people cross the floor over the last 30 years and it's normally because they don't feel respected by their own group and they feel that their own group isn't listening to them. Their leader is not paying attention. Uh, you know, I've got all these great ideas and nobody's paying attention to me and taking me seriously. And then, you know, we all play games, right. Uh, on both sides of the house is that, you know, we 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 uh, we encourage people to feel that sometimes, right? Mm. And so then people end up walking over, and it never normally works out well. You know, it just uh, it's not the way. The other thing I, I just I just want to say because I I you know just because you kind of raise it indirectly, you know, working in government or working in opposition, the two things are very different. Uh, there are advantages to being in government, but there's also advantages to being in opposition. And there's advantages to being a local member who's been around for a while, right? So the first part is, is that this whole argument, you don't get nothing unless you've got somebody on the government side. It's a stupid argument. Uh, most people don't buy it. And I think the results of that show in the elections. You know, if you look at our riding federally and provincially, we get as much funding as anybody else. Why? Because funding is divvied up by riding. 
any government in its right mind is not going to put all of their money in government writings because if they did, it'd be a scandal. So what they do is they say 127 ridings for Ministry of Transportation, let's divide accordingly. Now, one year, one riding will get more. The next year, the riding will get a little bit more. But it all sort of balances out. Being in government, and I was there, I was in government for five years. So uh, there is advantages. There's no question. There's certain things that you can do when you're on the government side uh, that is a lot easier to make. But you need the government to be on side. And... Uh, a good example of how difficult that is, is when we went through the Spruce Falls uh, takeover in campus casing. Uh, Spruce Falls wanted to essentially close down the mill. Uh, Len Wood, who was the NDP member at the time, myself, Shelley Martell, Howard Hampton, and a few others, were trying to find a way forward to be able to save that mill and do a worker ownership. Our premier didn't want to go there, Right. And we had a huge internal fight with Bob in order to get him to go the way of uh, employee ownership. The way that we finally got it to move is that we we, we kind of told the community in campus casing, you guys are going to come and put some pressure on Bob Ray. And we did that in an indirect way. Like we didn't say that publicly, obviously, because we didn't want to ambush our own premier. Uh, but we understood that we needed to get the public uh, to voice themselves in regards to how important this was. So the, the people of Kappa Skeesing, if you remember, took their trailers, they moved down to Toronto, they parked the trailers in the only time in the history of Ontario uh, Legislative Assembly, the people of Kappa Skeesing camped about, oh, we had to be a couple hundred trailers out on the front lot of Queen's Park for about a week or two. <laughs> and Len and I were out there almost every day working with people and saying, yeah, yeah, you know, come on in. We'll get you a meeting with Bob. You know, this, we'll get you a meeting with Shelley. We'll get you a meeting with Floyd or whatever, whatever. And eventually we turned our government's mind around to actually doing what we did. But that was harder to do on the inside of government than it would have been to do in the opposition, because in the opposition, we could have been much more upfront about it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's advantages on both sides. Like when you're on the opposition, you don't have a problem doing that kind of thing, because you know at the end of the day, uh, it's not it's not your premier that's on that, that's that's in your caucus. So there are advantages on both sides of being government and opposition, and I think it really comes down to to what degree can the local member do their job. That's really what it comes down to. So I have two questions: Is it more fun being in in power or, or opposition? Being in power. Being in power is more fun. Fun, even in it's in Queens Park. It's it's well, it's not necessarily more fun, but it's much more engaging, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so it depends on the government and how they operate. If I was premier, I'd be the very different premier of Ontario. I would I would engage the opposition in a di in a way that we're not doing today. The last person to have done that was Bill Davis. Bill Davis in the uh, 1970s engaged the opposition to be part of making the decisions of government, and as a result. He built himself a hell of a majority because people like what Bill Davis was doing because the NDP and the Liberals were working to make things work. Yeah. And in the end, it was the government that got the credit for it. And so I think governments are short-sighted. Like Dalton McGinty and, and, and Kathleen Wynne and Doug Ford, they're the worst at this. They, they believe that it's better to keep everything inside and for, for them to make the decisions. I think at the end of the day, that hurts them. This COVID-19 is changing that a little bit. The government's being a little bit, little bit more relaxed and we're doing things together more than we have before. And I think that's a good thing. And I think that's part of the reason why the government is doing so well. Why is Doug Ford getting such a good approval rating? Well, because he's looking at the opposition and he's saying, yeah, let's work together. Yeah. And so people are looking at all of us and saying, well, you're all working together. And who benefits from that? Yeah. Yeah. It's not the opposition. Andrea Horvath, as the leader of the official opposition, hardly gets in the media, no matter what she does, mm -hmm. because yeah. Doug Ford and Trudeau are on the TV every day doing the stuff that we're asking them to do. So what the, you know, where are you, right? <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> You know, it, it's 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 a bit of a it's a bit of an odd situation. Like Jagmeet Singh in this minority in this minority government has done more to advance the right of individuals when it comes to supports uh, in order to allow you to be able to survive through this than the government was willing to make initially. 
And they're just a small caucus of what, 24, 27, whatever they are. So, you know, it, it, it does work, right? Yeah. So I have one other question. Let's say Mr. Ford decides and he, he comes up with an idea where he says uh, he believes that public servants should take an additional Friday off every month in order to sit, to balance the budget. Like better. A social, sounds like a social contract. Would you be OK with that? <laughs> And I always laugh about how that is arguably one of the most conservative policies I've ever heard. But it was done by the social party. And people went bananas. Oh, you'll hear right wingers argue saying, well, remember the the Ray days? And they're so upset about it. It's like, that sounds like a conservative idea, which sounds like a, a like you would be on board with it. But they never are. Yeah. Well, listen, you know, the social contract was much maligned. Uh, you know, I think the difficulty we got into, in fairness, and I give the union movement uh, their due, is we should have never legislated it. That was the mistake. I think it had to be voluntary. And if nobody wanted to do it, then it had to be, all right, if you don't want to do the social contract, then just take the layoffs. That's what we should have done. Yeah, because it, uh, it's not a social just, contract yeah. if you legislate it, right? Yeah. And, and I think that's where we got kind of taken in on this whole thing is that there's a, there's a backstory to all of this thing is that the union movement had agreed to the social contract before we ever announced it. And that's what most people don't know. Mm-hmm. Right. I was there. I remember I was in the middle of it. I'm the only new Democrat elected who is still there from that government. I'm the last one. Right. <laughs> Uh, and I was in the middle of all those conversations because I came out of the Ontario Federation of Labor. I was a steelworker rep and I was an OFL rep before I became a politician. And so I dealt with OPSU, I dealt with CUPE, I dealt with ONA, I dealt with a whole bunch of different public sector unions and private sector unions as a result of my, you know, my, 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 uh, my, uh, my friendships in the labor movement. And there was actually an agreement to go there. And then when the cameras turned on the labor movement, the labor movement, some of them couldn't hold it together. And they started going after the government. And what happens when I when I go and punch you in the face, what do you do? Punch me back? That's right. You, Turn you the, the other back. cheek. Yeah, yeah. No, no, but that's not what that's not what we did, right? We we started defending ourselves yeah. and then it became a fight between us and the labor movement. And and I don't blame the public for having turned on us on that one because they were right. If we couldn't get a deal with the labor movement, who the hell could, hmm. right? In, yeah. in fairness to the public, uh, right. if, if it's just like, if we can't do it, nobody else can do it, right? Yeah. And I think that was a failure of our government and a failure of the labor movement at the same time that we couldn't get on the same page on something as fundamental as trying to deal with, how do you deal with deficits in times of economic hardship? And the labor movement had issues that it had to deal with in representing their members, and I understand that. That I'm, I used to negotiate for the unions, so I understand that. Uh, but the government also had realities that had to deal with the taxpayer, right? Yeah. So that yeah. that was that was uh, the, the, the you know that was the issue. I just know my mother loved it. She was in she's a uh, she was an Ontario public servant for like forty odd years. Yeah. She loved it. She said she's like I love the Ray days. She she wanted to go back <laughs> all the time. She got. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I, I always remember the one story. Uh, during the social contract days uh, negotiations and all of the labor movement was out uh, protesting in front of my office on Wilson, uh, not on Wilson, I used to be up on Algonquin. Uh, they were out there, they were protesting and rightfully so, that's their right and I respect that they did what they did. And uh, I remember I would go out to all the union meetings that I could get invited to in order to go hear what they had to say and People yelled at me and, you know, said things and all that kind of stuff. And I always remember going into one union meeting for a particular public sector workplace, which will not be named. And the person was just going up one side of me, down the other side of me, and up Bob Ray's side and down Bob Ray's <laughs> side. And about two, three months after the election, I went back to the labor, uh, that union meeting. And that same guy came, same guy got up and says, where's Bob Ray when we need him? Mike Harris is... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say a word. Uh, I thought, I'd split, right? you know, yeah. Bob Ray has left us, and they, they don't. They, oh, God, it was, it was, it was, <laughs> and and that person probably had no sense of irony or anything like no, that. No, no, right? I didn't say yeah, nothing. Yeah, you, because you got to expect people are where they're at, and it is what it is, right? Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> well, uh, gentlemen, uh, we have uh, surpassed the hour and 45 minute mark. Goes by quick, eh? Oh my God, we, we got to stop this. We got to stop doing this, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. uh, Jill, is there anything that you want to make sure you tell our listening audience uh, before yeah, we. I, uh... I, I think on the COVID 19 thing, I think, first of all, of us, all of us should, you know, uh, give ourselves a pat on the back. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've all been doing as best as we can, uh, trying to cope with this uh, new reality that we have. We've got some amazing people that work in our service sector, our health sector, our emergency services, who are out there every day uh, doing what they got to do in order to make sure that we uh, deal with the things that have to be dealt with. And we got to thank those people. I hope we come out of this at the other end with a better understanding of what we got to do in order to make sure that we treat people fairly in the workplace mm-hmm. when it comes to wages and different issues. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, let's, let's get back, you know, eventually we're going to beat this if we all do what what needs to be done and let's listen to the professionals. Let's not, uh, you know, let's not uh, all of a sudden uh, do things that uh, at the end of the day will put us in harm. So till then, been a, been a lot of fun guys yeah well thanks so much we really appreciate your time jill it's yeah. uh it was a great time so uh jason are you gonna sign us off with a good uh beer related quote tonight well since jill has said he's a uh, a man of uh, of history uh, i have a quote here from napoleon bonaparte on victory you deserve beer in defeat you need it <laughs> <laughs> cheers <laughs> From the man who got both. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks, guys. Thank you.